I think that we've got to be aware of the fact that there is a change taking place. It's taking place in Europe. What was a different political situation from one country to another is becoming a European-wide situation. We citizens are much more interested than in the past to what is happening in other European countries. And we know that what is happening politically in one country can have an effect on other countries, particularly four months before the European elections. Yes. But the European elections are a bit of a catalyst of this attention. But changes are taking place uh, among citizens uh, in our public opinion. So uh, politics follow, uh, we, or rather, politics take into account uh, the fact that citizens aren't only interested in domestic uh, policies, but they also want to take uh, place in other countries. Luigi De Maio and uh, Mr. Salvini, are they in power? You who are a moderate, uh, you are closer to Mario Monti. How do you get your voice heard? Well, you know that the two ministers are also the two uh, leaders of the political parties that have a majority in Italy, and Democrats Democratically, they exercise the political power that uh, has been given to them by the citizens. That said, I am not the only independent uh, member in the uh, government. The government is an interesting balance between uh, members of the two parties, and uh, there are a few ministers uh, who are independent. There is also a certain amount of dialectics going on, and what we're trying to do is to try and find the best uh, result. Well, is it you who tries to reach a, a consensus? It's not always uh, me, but there is another element which is uh, connected to what I was saying earlier on, namely that it is very difficult to today at the European level to speak of a traditional foreign policy. I think it is quite normal that each minister has a European uh, vision of things. And at the European level, we are obviously discussing certain things which at a domestic level are um, entrusted to ministers other than the Minister of Foreign Affairs. Well, why is there a conflict being created between Italy and France by your minister? Well, in a democratic uh, policy debate, I don't think criticism is negative. The fact that there is an open discussion, well, it's not a discussion quite often. They uh, called in uh, the uh, Italian ambassador to Paris to complain. Yes, that is part of uh, the traditional way uh, in uh, the diplomatic circle. But they have to adapt to the new reality. But the new reality, in my view, is that there is a, a political arena in Europe. There is a political space, which is uh, reflected uh, in the perspective uh, for the election, for, the, for better or worse. Well, we have to see. Political dialectics have become very difficult at the uh, domestic, na national, local level, at the regional level. So political dialectics can be very hard, uh, irrespective of the fora. But when we are at the European level, we are less well prepared, uh, because we always look at things uh, from a perspective between two different countries. But within the European Union, the fact that we are united, we speak much more openly and perhaps uh, without masking our real uh, feelings. There are divisions uh, in uh, all political competitions. Do you feel responsible? You uh, were part of uh, Mario Monti's uh, government. Do you feel responsible for the rise of populism in Italy? Do you feel uh, that uh, this uh, mistrust vis-à-vis uh, -vis the po political class, even though you are an independent, but uh, the populism that we see in Italy, is that the result of uh, that? Well, I think that in Italy, particularly the results of uh, the elections that took place in March of 2018, but in all the other countries, what we've seen, new political forces emerging, where political forces uh, which uh, more, were more marginal have emerged, and that is perhaps the fruit. You can call them populist, although personally, I don't think that that is a very 
precise definition. But the fact that they are different political forces with different uh, political forces compared to the political parties of the past is the result of a certain number of things uh, which haven't been properly handled either at the national or at the European level. Two examples of that. On the one hand, you've got the uh, financial economic crisis, uh, which has really uh, had a terrible, devastating effect in Europe. We've dealt with it to a certain extent. We could have gone faster. But I think that citizens really thought that we were going to go faster and uh, that uh, we didn't really have the right solutions for financial solutions. And uh, then there is the crisis uh, on the migration front. And there was a lot of problems with this, uh, not only at the European level, but within countries. And that has led a lot of uh, citizens uh, to look at other political parties with a different message. Do you deplore that? Well, it depends. It depends on how those political forces are going to contribute to the political discussion in the country. But you could be in a minority in four months' time. Well, we have to see what's going to happen at the European elections. Well, that's going to be interesting. For the very first time, we're going to see real political elections. Uh, I think that citizens in the European Union will realize for the first time it's not a, a just a, a repeat of the political balances in Europe. It will be real political elections which could change uh, the face of things. And I think that you've got different visions of Europe which will be in uh, competition. Mrs. Maslom, you represent the European uh, Commission. No. It is uh, the European States. It is the Parliament. We propose. We're not, we're not the legislator. Well, we say the legislator. Well, you adopt uh, laws. Now, Brussels is uh, the enemy of the populace. Even in France, uh, during uh, the gilets jaunes upheavals, uh, I think that everybody thinks uh, that uh, there is no progress in Europe. Do you feel uh, uh, responsible when uh, people trample underfoot the European flag? No. I think you've got to see things clear. Yes, uh, there is this movement of the gilets jaunes, the yellow vest. The, or the high visibility vest. You've got the populist, the nationalist. Uh, you've got uh, the anti-immigration uh, forces in uh, Europe. And we'll see what uh, this is going uh, to lead to. And I'm frightened about this. Yes, you're frightened. Yes, let me finish, though. There is another movement which isn't uh, that. If you look at the opinion uh, polls in all the European countries, support for the European Union and European cooperation is uh, at its highest level in 10 years, with the exception of uh, Now, it seems that populists have the wind in their sails. Yes, they have the wind in their sails, but they're still a minority. If you look at the opinion polls, which are carried out uh, over the last uh, 20 years in the same way, the same number of respondents, and we see that support for the EU is very strong, and particularly amongst young people. Yes, amongst young people. And that means uh, that everything is uh, fine and dandy. No, there are lots of problems. The notion that all uh, Europe is against the EU is wrong. Well, why is there so much hatred? Do you ask yourself that question? Why such hatred? Yes, of course I ask myself that question. I cannot explain that uh, easily in two minutes. I think uh, the minister spoke about the economic crisis. Of course that has created an enormous amount of uh, ill feeling. There's social problems, political problems in all the countries, particularly in those countries that have been most affected. And a lot of politicians have used that fear, that uh, situation which uh, people are confronted with, in order to say, well, I've got an easy uh, solution for you. And there are no easy solutions. The populists have used that. They've leveraged that. The minister also mentioned another aspect, namely that uh, there is a, a problem in the countries to, to take joint responsibility for the migratory flows. Is it a failure? Of course it is a failure. But it's a failure by the member states. Why? We are 27 uh, countries amongst the richest in the world. We could take responsibility to welcome refugees that really need protection. We could do that together. And we could also fight to ensure that we protect our borders in a trusting manner. But we've got to take that responsibility together. The fact that certain countries refuse, the Visegrad countries, Hungary uh, is a case in point. Yes, these uh, countries sent to refugees to my country, to your country. Uh, they sent refugees 40 years ago. This is a situation which hasn't uh, led to a lot of uh, trust. 
But et let me repeat, there is this situation, then there is Brexit, but there is a European ce, Union, and in this particular period, what we have seen is de, de, that de, de countries de have had the possibility de, de, de to strengthen and deepen European cooperation by taking de measures de in the field of defence, uh, in the social sphere, also on uh, digital uh, developments. We want to be able to do this also in the field of defence. We, do, we can't just talk about the Gilets Jaunes now. You know, there are also marches of young people, thousands of young people, who are demonstrating for a more responsible climate uh, policy. The fact that power has uh, slipped away from national parliaments. Isn't that the fact that there are too many standards and regulations? But if you look at the thousand people in the streets in Poland and Hungary who go and demonstrate with the European flag against uh, their government. Is that a resistance form? There are thousands of them. They are against their government. They are in favor of Europe. Mr. Bouba, you are at the head of a big French group, AXA Insurance. Let me ask you, uh, cooperation treaty in Aachen, signed between France and Germany, signed a few days ago, and it led to fake news. How is it possible at a time of Europe that this should take place? I think that uh, this uh, Aachen Treaty is a very positive development. Why? Because it strengthens the, the importance of the Franco-German axis. Of course, there are always people who try to uh, produce fake news about the contract or the compact, but I think it is very good that the two key nations in Europe come together on behalf of Europe. But some say it's an act of betrayal. Betrayal vis-à-vis -vis whom? No, there is no act of betrayal. Is there a lack of explanations when there is a treaty that is set up between France and Germany? Perhaps there is a lack of educational uh, um, process. I mean, why do people think uh, that this is uh, something negative, this treaty? I think that Europe is taken as something we take for granted. If you talk to young people, well, they say, well, I've always lived in Europe. That is my day-to-day -day life. They don't understand the security issues. They don't understand uh, the uh, issue of peace. And I think uh, that we've got to pe make people aware of what we have achieved. And then people have also lost a connection between uh, the people. Now, the Gilets jaunes are not against Europe. Some of them are uh, trampling uh, the European uh, flag underfoot. Now, I've been on these uh, roundabouts. They're not radical people. They're people like you and me, people who are often in single-parent households. And what they're telling you is, I don't like France anymore. They say very often, I am all alone. Nobody speaks to me. I can no longer express my views. And I think that you've got to re-establish a connection with people. And you've got to go towards people. And that is why I think it is uh, important to, to understand that it's depressing what is happening in Europe. But at the same time, it's good because people are expressing their views. It is also an opportunity to take their input. But how do we reconnect with people? I think we need to, to discuss. What is lacking today is a dialogue. If I look in my own industry, yes, we are doing pretty well in Europe, but there are sometimes uh, we are outside reality, even in my own industry, in my own sector. We've got to go to people. We've got to talk to them and bring them on board. I think that we do the same thing in a company. I'm not the best strategist, uh, but I am the person who facilitates uh, the uh, dialogue between people, and you've got to do the same thing at the political level. Timothy Snyder, as an American intellectual, what do you think about what is happening in Europe? You say that uh, history uh, uh, doesn't repeat itself. It is uh, something that is taught. Now, you can, of course, uh, draw negative uh, conclusions. You can see that it is. Uh, the effect of uh, globalization. You, you can also take the lessons of the 1920s and 30s. I think, of course, that there are populists. There are also populists in the United States, in my country, but also in Europe. And uh, they have uh, drawn some lessons uh, from the period I've referred to. I think that globalization is a fact, and you've got to make certain choices uh, so that uh, globalization can continue. And those 
those are choices which uh, concern technology, uh, equality, etc. These are lessons that we can draw from the past. Is it not too late? I think that what history teaches us is that it's never too late. It is never too late. Europe tomorrow will come. In the past, uh, in, or at least in the future, there are certain things which uh, we won't uh, reproduce. I think uh, that history is greater than our imagination. What is going to happen is not what we are predicting is going to happen, but it's not too late. And I think that now it is uh, very good that uh, the Americans and uh, the Europeans have a challenge to face. It is not true that democracy and globalization uh, don't need to have something to help them. Historically speaking, what they need is uh, to have boldness, boldness uh, at the political level. Well, we'll come back to that idea later on. So the, this is the end of the first part of this uh, special Davos uh, uh, dialogue. Welcome to the second part of our special uh, discussion on the European elections and the rise of populism. What can we expect of uh, the uh, uh, elections on 26th of May next? Uh, at the time of Brexit, uh, can we give a taste of Europe uh, back to, to people? Mr. Snyder, we finished off with you in the first part. You were talking about the fact that we lack boldness or courage. Yes. I think that that's a problem with the populace. We see or we think that the populace are uh, brave or courageous in coming up with new ideas. But if we're thinking about the future, we've got to think about how we want to shape the future. And that is precisely where we see a problem with populism. And it's uh, something that affects us all. We're all on the defensive, we, re we resist, but we don't have people thinking about the future. And that is paradoxical, because it is in the future that Europe uh, will have to become, or could become, a power, because the environmental problems, uh, uh, the problem with the black hole of taxes, monopolies, uh, human rights uh, at the time of digitization, it is only Europe that has uh, the power to become a power. What do you mean by that? I think that China is looking to the future and it's uh, manipulating things. The United States aren't looking at the future. But uh, they're very short-termist uh, in Italy. They look at the present. Is that what you mean? I think that that is the, the right term, short-termist. But I think it's only Europe that has started to, to address the issues of our century. That is a uh, problem of young people, human rights and the environment. These are issues that interest young people. And it's only Europe that can do something. So you've got to give a, a prospects uh, to people. But you've got to have a vision, not a, an American perspective, not an anti Chinese perspective, but you've got to have a, a, a vision for Europe, which is the only power which can really meet the challenges. The only power uh, that can stand up uh, to the United States and China? Is that how you see Europe today? Not in the meaning that you've got to criticize the Americans or the Chinese all the time. No, but I think that uh, in a globalized world, we all have to face the same problems. The Chinese have already made certain choices. 
The Americans aren't capable of making any choices at the moment. But in Europe, you have perhaps the only institution that has really understood, uh, at least passively, what are the real challenges and which have the instruments to deal with them. And that is precisely why Europe has so many enemies. But uh, uh, Europe uh, is very divided today. It should come together around the ideas you're talking about, around these challenges. What do you mean by that? I said that Europe today is very divided. But that is normal. That is a, a bit of a syndrome. You always talk about the divisions. Brexit. Brexit is a case in point. It's stupid, it's a disaster, but at the same time, it is an example of European processes. Now, we've had two years of negotiations, two, hours, uh, two years of discussion, and now nothing is being done. And that's perhaps good compared with uh, the Americans. It's very good. Why is it good? Uh, I don't think that there will be a Brexit, quite honestly, but I think it is, I think that the divisions in Europe are real, they exist, but at the same time it's normal, it's natural that there should be divisions, and you can live with those divisions if you understand that it is only in a large institution that we are able to talk to the Americans and the Chinese, and in a globalized world, that is important. Alors, pour être un peu plus court terme, Matteo Salvini, donc le ministre de l'Intérieur, pousse un front souverainiste avec le Hongrois Victor Orban, mais aussi Marine Le Pen et puis euh, Jaroslaw Kaczynski en Pologne. Il veut rassembler les forces populistes et dans quatre mois, il y a ces européennes. Est-ce que ça vous inquiète Est-ce qu'il va y parvenir Je crois que ce que vous venez de, de dire maintenant montre exactement la profondeur du, 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 de ce changement politique qui, qui se passe en Europe. It shows that there are great uh, differences in uh, Europe and there are great changes uh, going on at the moment. So, what we're trying to do is uh, seek certain alliances, even where there are no natural alliances. And we're not... Uh, you have different uh, parties in uh, different European countries, uh, which might be seen as socialist, or which might be seen as populist. Now, we don't often realize that they are linked between themselves. If we look at the political forces today, we can see uh, what kind of links there might be. But, so you're saying there are links between these different groups? Yes, well, there are and there aren't. If uh, one, uh, um, uh, they are linked when you look at those who are most critical of Europe, but if you look in specific terms, Though. If you, you look at these nationalist different. routes, there Donc, are certain differences, of course. But uh, we will see what comes of this. We still have a number of months, uh, so as uh, to consider it, so that we can uh, um, uh, look at this and see what happens in day-to-day -day politics, and we'll see what comes of the elections. So you're saying that you're in favor of these uh, populist movements? Well, well, I think it's part of uh, this Europe, really. It's part of political Europe, really. Europe, which doesn't really have any traditional borders anymore. And, uh, I think, though, what we have to try and do here, the real question is this. There may well be different alliances, uh, different to what they were in the past when we come to the elections, but uh, citizens will then uh, vote and we'll get the results of that. Now, depending on those results, uh, the European uh, uh, Parliament, you will then get majorities being formed. Now, we know that the uh, European Parliament majorities uh, might uh, be different to what you get at national parliaments. It might not be as um, strong as... Uh, but it might this time be a little bit more clear-cut. As I read it, up to now, there's always been a majority. And then uh, there, was, uh, there was a kind of majority, even if it wasn't explicit, and if it didn't rally to the majority, and then you had certain minorities. But this time, you could have a majority and a clear, and then a minority, which for the first uh, time, it would be a kind of opposition at the European Parliament. So the first question is, uh, once the uh, vote has been taken in May, whether the European Parliament uh, is prepared to uh, work with the uh, 
majority la and with an opposition. Sera, now, déjà, the proof la of that would uh, be uh, uh, who ensuite, the, the appointment of the next president of the commission Ça, and the appointment of commissioners. Now, uh, this is Ça, um, avis, unknown territory, test, really, vrai, and that is going to be the real test here. That'll be the real proof positive of what we're just thinking about at the moment. Cécilia Malmström, l'Europe a-t-elle finalement then. suffisamment protégé les pays de la globalisation uh, uh, protected those who've lost from globalization. No, it hasn't. And I think that explains a lot of these um, movements that we now see, because uh, coming back to the economic crisis, where a lot of uh, people lost their houses, their jobs, uh, and even their hopes, particularly younger people, because we have a high youth unemployment in many countries still. Les, les, les États membres Member pas States didn't or didn't have the strength, the will, or the ability uh, to uh, protect people sufficiently. Social, so uh, what about the social side of Europe, though? Is that where the challenge is? Well, Ms. Malm, the les, responsibility les is uh, uh, with Member States. It is up to them to protect their citizens, and they haven't made uh, the uh, necessary reforms uh, to slice up the cake of uh, globalization, because it works, if it works well, it's good. They haven't reformed their system, their social systems, uh, um, the tax redistribution. They haven't invested in uh, skill acquisition and education that, that the people need so that people could move to different places. And uh, what Europe has done recently, and this wasn't possible a few years ago, we've tried to, to develop a social agenda because uh, Europe's not just economics, it's also the social side. So what is that agenda, though? We don't actually see it. You say there are things happening in different countries and there are differences between countries. Countries. Well, there are certain limits to what can be done because social Europe is how you distribute wealth to some extent, and there's no legal power of the Commission to do that. That's a national competition, competence. So what we can do is set certain standards, do some benchmarking, to actually set certain targets that everyone should try and move towards, and that could be a minimum. But this is controversial, though, because who is going to fund the social? It's, it's funded from taxation, and we don't have European taxation. So Therefore, the real responsibility here lies with the member states, uh, and they're not doing enough. Would you be in favour of European tax for social purposes? Well, I'm a wee bit sceptical about it. I think uh, this would mean a very different Europe. But it's something that can be discussed in coming years. I think it's good. Uh, there is so much division at the moment within Europe. So I think this is something that we could look at. We could uh, talk about a social tax and so defence and so on. That might be one way to do things. And it's up to citizens to decide because for the first time, and I think Mrs. Wright, we can mobilize young people because there are a lot of things which are at stake at the moment. We're talking about European values. We've got, but it's also not just the economy, it's, uh, it's the value. These values, yes. And this might be this final commission, the last commission, that is made up of people who believe in Europe. It might be the last commission that really is made up of people who really believe in Europe. And are you worried about that? Yes, I'm very worried because uh, there are very strong movements, there are European movements uh, who are against foreigners, and uh, they're going to use foreigners to fight against foreigners. And uh, we see this with the mobilization of uh, populists uh, and the anti-immigration parties, and that bothers me, worries me, because they're against Europe. And if uh, you uh, have uh, someone who's appointed uh, to the Commission, then you might have people within the European Commission who don't see uh, Europe uh, as has been traditionally seen. Uh, and that Thomas does Bouber, worry me. Uh, Thomas Bouber. Now, uh, there is a growing uh, Euroscepticism, and uh, Oxfam says that this is getting worse. And uh, you've, uh, what should be done? What should be put, set up in France? I mean, you were asked by Mr. Macron on this. What did you say to Macron when he asked you what should be done in France? We have different responsibilities today. You look at governments, and uh, they have to do more on the social side. But if you take the French system, which is uh, one of uh, the most developed in terms of redistribution of wealth, then you do wonder why is this going on in France? And you can't uh, to just uh, look to the government these days. You also have to bring in uh, companies as well. They have to be part of that social commitment. Well, are they doing enough? Well, 
This is what I said to Mrs. Macron. I, we agreed with 13 companies, and it was a six days, and we did this digitally. We said that we would give specific commitments on training, on apprenticeships, and also we, each company is going to provide a service for the people who need it, and that would be free of charge. And then we would do some tracking as to who's done what. And what we're trying to do is broaden that, but at the moment, companies have to sign up to it. We can't just look to government to expect them to do that and leave them the responsibility. So, now I think one of the yellow vests thing, they wanted to say there should be more commitment from bigger companies, and are they still expecting that? Yeah, I think we can say that that will come, and it's a process, because at the moment the system's moving, it's changing. At the moment, we're in a society which is so divided, which is so fragmented, and what we're doing is we're grasping what's happening. If you're in Paris, and now you're a little bit in the Paris bubble, but what's really going on is going out on outside Paris. So and now we have to see how we can help the people who are in France, and we have to look at the companies who are throughout France, and they need to give a commitment, and they have to provide services. Now, on training, are you going to uh, perhaps pay people a bit more? Are you going to reflect training in uh, salary? Well, every company is uh, been discussing this, and we have taken this opportunity uh, to uh, look at the situation and uh, looking at bonuses and also looking at um, pay levels. Is that enough? Well, it's never enough, but I think it's a good start. And uh, I think uh, they were expecting a, a strong gesture, I think, uh, from the um, big companies in France, but we didn't really get that. So there wasn't anything uh, very strong from companies. Well, a, a financial gesture is a short-term thing, and it uh, doesn't really deal with the medium term. We need a commitment uh, from uh, companies and the people who work for them. And uh, this event, this event here has certainly changed people's thinking, and I've seen a lot of companies who have now said, OK, I now want to do give a commitment and I want to, to help. Are you doing that today? Yes, indeed. Yes, we've done this, and this is nothing new about this. There are a lot of companies who have already done a great deal, but uh, perhaps it wasn't appreciated, perhaps it wasn't realized, but I think we have to do more. Mr. Timothy Snyder, now we can see that Brexit, well, there's a real risk here. There could be some uh, implosion within the United Kingdom and uh, populist, uh, and you see them in Poland and in Hungary, and the, the Visegrad group, which not have the, the same perceptions, the same values as Europe. And uh, we call them illiberal democracies. So uh, the uh, Europe of 1945, uh, might that just explode or might it simply disappear? I think that you have to start by saying that these four countries are very different. Hungary defines itself uh, as a liberal uh, democracy, but Slovakia, that would not be the case. Slovakia, now I don't know if you know this, but it, recently it's been an example of a very active uh, society. They've been very anti-corruption, and uh, also the uh, murder of a journalist. And in Bratislava, you can see that there are some very interesting things happening and very positive things happening. Now, turning to Poland, there are certain negative uh, developments there, but there have been elections, and it was quite clear that there is a clear alternative. There is a, a feisty media, and uh, there's uh, still a population which is very pro-European. But to answer your question, I think that the mistake made by some Hungarian and Polish politicians is to believe that they can uh, use the European uh, Union uh, um, and also at the same time undermine its legitimacy. Um, they're not going to do that. That's not going to be successful in the long term. Well, well, they seem to be doing well at the moment. Well, I, as I see it, the risk is this. It's not... Uh, the uh, union is going to break down. I think the real danger is, and uh, seen from uh, Budapest or Warsaw, that uh, there will be a different uh, Europe where Germany is perhaps more powerful. Uh, we might be even talking about a two-speed Europe here. Yeah. Now, for Hungary and Poland, that would mean exclusion. There could be a different Europe. 
But it might be worse for the Hungarians and for the Poles, and that's the risk for them. So they have to realize then that that might be the worst possible solution for them. And that's what you're saying. Mr. Enzo, Mr. Enzo um, Italy, I have to say this, is seen as the weak link in Europe. Um, is it going to leave the Eurozone, do you think? No, I don't think so. And this has been discussed a great deal when uh, we had the last uh, Italian budget. But it was a bit of a tussle with Brussels, wasn't it? But it was, uh, um, that's allowed for in the rules, though. The rules uh, set down certain parameters, but uh, they do allow governments uh, to uh, propose their budget, and national parliaments uh, can uh, decide whether they approve it or not. So. Between the, the two, there is some discussion, of course, with the European Commission and uh, with the uh, Council of Ministers, uh, which deals with um, uh, finance and the economy, so as uh, to make sure these national laws are exempt. So you're saying that this is a guarantee, then, you're saying, Europe, that it doesn't leave the Europe. Yes, I think it's two-way traffic here. I think that there's, uh, for all countries who are part of this, it establishes a certain rules. It established a basic framework against a wit, and you have to deal with act within that. Now, there are a number of responsibilities which remain at national level, and at national level what's important is that uh, this be done and uh, exercised uh, um, democratically and democracy doesn't always do what you want it to do. Well, this worries the markets. Uh, there's a general concern in the European economy because of what's going on in Italy. Well, yes and no. We are worried about the uh, slowdown in uh, the big economies in Europe, uh, and certainly economies bigger than ours. No, but it's particularly uh, Europe, though. I think uh, Europe is uh, having a sort of a, a downward pressure on the uh, eco European economy. Well, looking at Europe, though, if we're looking nationally, I think we certainly want to improve our economic performance. But if I look at this uh, wearing a European hat, I would say that uh, after the financial crisis, there are other parts of the world uh, looking at the United States of America, for example, uh, which uh, recovered uh, much more quickly from the crisis. And uh, there are certain problems that they still have, but uh, and they 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 cope with this better than Europe. We didn't get out of it as well as the USA. And why is that? This depends on them, that there is not sufficient uh, consistency between the various governments. One of the problems that we have in Europe, uh, I mean, this isn't just new, I mean, but I think we have uh, certainly seen this in uh, Europe because of what's gone on politically, that this uh, mix of uh, um, both competition and uh, cooperation uh, between uh, economic players and uh, member states and uh, these uh, constitutions which are both at national and uh, um, supranational level, sometimes it works, but sometimes it doesn't work. And I think uh, that's what we've seen now. So uh, you're saying uh, you got the five uh, star and you got the Liga and uh, they got the election in the elections. And uh, there were... So you've also got a European legitimacy as well. So you've got competing legitimacies. So I think this is going to be changed by the uh, EP parliaments, though. I think they'll help us bring these together. And uh, we'll see what those results bring, and we'll see what happens in the various countries. Well, yes, that uh, might uh, sort of help to merge things. We might not be able to come up well with a general conclusion to this, though. This is um, Man Malmström. Do we have to look again at the powers of the European Union? Might that be something that the incoming president has to deal with? Well, perhaps. But I don't think that's the most important thing that we need to mobilize citizens in Europe for the election. Well, of course, we can always look at these things again, but I think for the moment, what we're trying to do and what we have to continue to do uh, is uh, to get the results because uh, we want to see results. And as Mr. Schneider said, um, uh, we've got climate change, we've uh, got uh, terrorism, uh, those are the big challenges. I'm sorry, but in uh, climate, uh, we were further ahead that five years ago than we are today. So something that, that no longer works. I think we were more progressive then than now.
Okay. There are certain challenges in Europe. But we used to be... We, uh, sorry, could you keep, stop interrupting me? Could you please let me answer? So, no, I think you have to see the results, and I would agree with you. Uh, now, I think we could be more ambitious uh, regarding climate change, uh, but if you look at Europe as a whole, it's 28. Europe of 28, 1 plus 1 plus 1. Now, no, we, perhaps we haven't done enough, uh, but... Perhaps, uh, however, I think we can say that uh, Katowice wouldn't have been as successful as it was without Europe. So, uh, Europe of the 28th, then, has to try and make uh, um, progress. With the digital world, uh, we've got trade. We're looking at the single market uh, so that we can uh, and, uh, reform it. We have to look at social Europe. We have to look at investment into innovation. We have to look at uh, small companies, um, education, training, and so on. And we can, uh, we certainly have uh, projects on this. Uh, we're working on member states. On this, and I think we have to uh, really focus on getting genuine results so that we can show citizens that we're listening to their concerns. So, how are you going to tell them uh, that these are these results? How are you going to do that in just four months? Well, we're going to do what we can. All members of the uh, Commission are traveling at the moment, and which is what we're already doing, in fact. Uh, I think we're doing a lot of these kind of town hall meetings, uh, and we're doing that. We could do more. But uh, I think we have to show uh, leadership in, in all so that we can really mobilize here and so that we can uh, try and uh, show uh, you it's wrong to uh, blame all bad things in the world on Brussels because that's not the way in which we're going to get good decisions taken and we're going to get a proper vote. So how can you give people a sort of a, a wish for it? Does it not seem as a wee bit bureaucratic? Uh, how can you give people a sort of a, a, see it as a positive thing? No, it's not democratic. Uh, for example, uh, we're working on anti-terrorism. That's not bureaucratic. And, uh, okay, oh, yeah, perhaps uh, you could say that uh, institutional reform is a bit technocratic here. You asked whether this would be a job of the incoming president, but we're doing some very specific stuff, though. We listen to citizens, we dialogue, uh, and we um, bring them into our decisions. Well, how do you do that? Is, I guess you do that at the European Parliament. Were the uh, members of the European Parliament and uh, those who are standing for the elections? Certainly. But we in the Commission, uh, within our limits, we do what we can. Uh, we do this every week, practically every day. But uh, we have to mobilize uh, the uh, national ministers and uh, prime ministers for these European elections. Thomas Bubel, now, finally, you said that we need a third p pathway. I mean, what would that be in Europe? And it's so what the professor said, I think we have to uh, look at uh, what our differentiation is. Well, it's our values uh, that uh, differentiate us, and it's also our ability to set standards. And one of the things I think that which was quite uh, is the uh, GPR. That is uh, to say the data regulations. We were the first in Europe to do this. And I think for the next commission, that's going to be very important to say what are our priorities. Well, clearly climate change is one of them. And as I see, uh, the digital revolution, but uh, not uh, just we copy Google and Facebook. I think we have to come up with our own pathway, and we do that based on our, our own strong points, um, transport, uh, aviation, and thirdly, we have to see how we can uh, reinvent the social contract, because our values is, that, and it's always been a very social one, I think uh, that system is uh, now come to the end of what it can do, and we have to reinvent it, and I want that to happen, because today we talk about China, we talk uh, and about the United States all the time, but, but we never talk about Europe. And uh, for me, Brexit isn't uh, the fact that it's there. I think that this is really damaging to Europe's reputation. And I think uh, we have to look into the future here so that we can reinvent Europe. We have to decide what our own pathway is, and we have to have a very specific project to do it. Um, uh, twinning, Erasmus, that's all disappeared. And I think we have to wake that all up again. Well, thank you uh, very much, uh, Duma Buba. And, uh, um, uh, all of you, uh, to all the speakers, uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you to all of you as well to having uh, been with us uh, in the French. Uh, and uh, thank you very much. Um, please stay. We've now got uh, 50 minutes for questions. Please, feel free. Yes, please. 
On m'attend. Can you hear me? Je suis un journaliste de Corriere uh, della Sera, uh, Italie. I'm from Italy, from the La Sera. Uh, so I have a question to the Italian minister, not because I'm in Italia, because there are two things. And we saw the um, Aachen summit. Now, amongst those agreements is the agreement between France and Germany that they would uh, consult on all these matters before looking to other countries. What do you think about that? And uh, perhaps I could say something else. You said uh, that, uh, that it's normal that there might be disagreements within a uh, you know, political space, but uh, um, member states are doing quite a lot. Now, does this concern you? Does it worry you that uh, it is there are certain problems created by the Italian government and that Italy is isolated, uh, as was said by Commissioner Malmström? Well, you've got a micro. You can you can answer. Thank you. Now, following this question about uh, how isolated Italy might be and whether it's isolated or not. Now, what really strikes me in all of this is that Europe and the European Union is now has a, is like an archipelago of different islands, really, from rather being a, all together. So uh, we see uh, there's a certain group, we've got the Visegrad group, we've also got uh, the, uh, the Nordic or the Baltic group, uh, or whatever it's called, and uh, there's the Mediterranean as uh, well, where we should also have a group as well. So we don't want to let the others have one, and we don't. And so we have a Now, uh, basically, we don't have any particular axis here. And now you could uh, talk about the, the um, uh, French German axis. And uh, I think we have to put this into its proper context, uh, though, rather than uh, saying that a country is isolated. However, there is certainly a risk in Europe, and that is uh, that we might uh, lose that ability to talk. And I think that's the most important thing. We have to be able to, uh, to have uh, dialogue. We have to be able to uh, talk about things, even uh, to disagree. And uh, sometimes we have to perhaps be a little bit um, forthright in how we do that, as we've recently seen. But I think we have to be able to do that. We have to be able to disagree, to agree to disagree. And uh, it's not by getting uh, putting together a agreements, where you've got the Franco-German ones, and let's have another one um, with Italy in it, or another one or with the Netherlands, or whatever, or with Sweden, and those countries represented. I think that the most important thing is that we have uh, to uh, be able to talk to each other, and we have to keep that and safeguard that. And uh, therefore, I think this discussion at the moment, even if it's uh, quite harsh, even if it uh, doesn't uh, uh, seem uh, uh, to be respecting uh, um, uh, national. But I think there should be no no-go areas, though, and I think we need to be able to do that in the European public space. Um, we spoke about it in theoretical terms of the past, uh, uh, but it was Habermas who said that, wasn't it? Uh, and I think he was a very illustrious thinker. But I think this European space is something that's going to come about because of that. Now, if you live in a, uh, in a block of flats, you have to discuss with the resi other residents. And I think you have to, uh, you have to decide whether you're going to fix the roof or fix the heater. And uh, therefore, it's important to do it that way. Thank you. Yes, you have the floor. Bonjour, uh, I'm Global Shaper, uh, I'm Global Morocco. Shaper from uh, France and Morocco. About uh, 10 years ago, there was a poll done, and it uh, says uh, that uh, 65 of, uh, people, percent of uh, people were in favor of uh, Europe. Uh, now, uh, people are now defensive because of uh, nationalist, uh, uh, but uh, sometimes the arguments against that are rather technical. So why are politicians uh, being so careful? Uh, why are they being so lacking in zeal for the uh, European project? And uh, what about the idea of uh, a federal Europe, a political Europe, even a uh, fiscal Europe? So what would you like to say about uh, any on those? Just now, we said that there was no great European thought at the moment, and I think we could say that there's no real European vision at the moment, such as the vision that really moved the founders. 
in the post-war period. Il est vrai. Il yeah, faut retrouver I think what we have to do is uh, find again things that could coeurs, mobilize people, things that could uh, make et, et the heartbeat faster, not just the brain or the wallet. But uh, I think this is a de, challenge, de, de though, and it's a challenge at national level. I'm not saying it's uh, easier for every country to do this uh, domestically. It's no easier to do it nationally than it would at European plus level. Plus but at a uh, European level, Alors, it is a wee bit more complex. Now, I think it would be a good idea for everyone to read Robert Schuman's declaration of 9th of May 1950. And now, I'm not just being nice to you because it's a French television, no, but uh, it says everything there. Now, he was talking about the Cotton Steel Committee, he was talking about reaching out to Germany, we're talking about 1950, and that tells you something. He also spoke of Africa, he spoke about the uh, European Europe's responsibility to Africa. Now, is that not also topical? He uh, spoke about a European federation, and that was the purpose behind this. So that was the political idea of Africa. Jean Monnet said, OK, first uh, we'll put together economics and markets and so on, and then we'll come to political union. Now, maybe still that's un still underway, but I think we can say we're halfway across the river at the moment. And, and I think we have to be mindful of that. Now, uh, this idea of a uh, European uh, um, discussion, uh, a very forthright discussion, might uh, show uh, that we do share these uh, challenges, because we do need to relaunch things, and we also need to appeal to people's hearts as well. So I think that's uh, really the situation that we face today. It's true. We need a very great debate on the future of Europe. What are we going to do? What are we heading for? What has the future in store for us? What are we going to do to get that? Uh, are we going to proceed at different speeds? We need a debate on that. On the side of the Commission, we try to organize a debate of that sort with about, about 1,000 people participating in a number of countries. In France, there's the great debate as well, and in the Netherlands as well. We talk to thousands of people but we still have to talk to quite a lot of them um, to try and take stock on where we stand. But this debate cannot be done after finding solutions. It has to be done in order to find solutions. We're, we are at the middle of the river, as you just said. But we've got to be pragmatical. We've got to unite, try and find out about the future, try to reunite everybody around the same concepts of Europe. Uh, we have to proceed without the Brits, and uh, we need concrete results. And as far as this debate is concerned, I'm more federalistic, of course. Uh, a fiscal union, it's fine, but it's not going to be done in the short run. We have to start the debate, indeed. And when I travel throughout Europe, I see all youth and young people wanting this debate. So, um, so organize this debate, um, exercise a pressure on your governments, uh, um, municipalities, etc. The debate has to be organized not only before the elections, but now. As of now, it is, need it is needed. I'm a journalist at CNBC and I'm going to ask the question in English, no problem. Um, Mr. Milanese touched on the definition of populism, that perhaps this is not the best word. So I was wondering, what is populism and what is the actual concept that you're trying to fight? Because if we don't understand that, then the fight is really, there, there's no sense for it. Thank you. Okay, now, just to, just to avoid misunderstanding, of course I understand the meaning which is normally given to the word populism. I think, at least, uh, uh, that I understand it. I wonder if this is uh, really the best definition for a variety of uh, different uh, political parties, political messages, political movements, and so on. If it's a catch-all definition uh, that we conventionally uh, agree to adopt, why not? I, I wonder if it's really the right one. I think that there are, uh, and not only in certain European countries, the amazing thing is that we have that everywhere in Europe, everywhere around in Europe. There are movements, there are political parties, there is a political debate, there are political messages which broadly answer to what? To the lack of hope, the lack of trust, which is uh, uh, 
unfortunately, widespread among the population. But uh, in spite of the word unfortunately, I think that we need to pay an answer to that. And uh, inevitably, the fact that in democracy, these kind of questions go into a vote uh, for a political movement or a political party is not uh, at all, in my view, negative in itself. The, the question is, would that allow the answer to be given? And, but the, the fact that we need to answer to what people uh, uh, don't trust anymore, to what people ask to get, to what people wish to get, uh, is uh, uh, compulsory for everyone. Mm. Traditional parties, new parties, populist parties, non-populist parties, whatever kind of, uh, of definition we, we adopt. So I do not want to contest the word in itself. I think it's a bit uh, a sort of approximation, but we can adopt it conventionally as uh, the one we can use. Another question. We have just a few minutes. Go ahead, sir. Four minutes. Gentleman over there. And then a lady over here. Good afternoon. I'm going to ask my question in English as well. My name is Dan Ewert. I'm a global shaper from Amsterdam. And what I'm wondering is, um, in the past, we used to have like a vision for Europe. Uh, we had really great projects. We had open borders. We had a common currency. So these were really positive things. And it reminds me of yesterday when I was sitting in a session with uh, the founder of Alibaba, Jack Ma. He mentioned that in China and in Africa, there's a lot of energy. And people look to a bright future. And they have future visions. So what do you think would be the big project for Europe, where we can all look together to something mm -hmm. positive, rather than looking at the negative elements that Europe brings us? So who wants to answer? Timothy Snyder, maybe? So, sure. As the only American on the panel. <laughs> um, so I, returning to this gentleman's question, I, I think there's a way that you're fated to Europe, which isn't always clear. Um, je veux dire, il y a un malentendu historique. There's a historical misunderstanding where there were nation states. And there there is a problem. There were nation states. It's an illusion. The choice, the choice in Europe is between integration and empire. And if European integration is weakened now, that means that other empires, whether they're Chinese or American or Russian, grow stronger. That's the calculation. The big illusion is that one can go back to the nation state. And I mention this because I think the real division in European politics is not between populism and Europe. It's between past and future. Yeah. The way that the people we call the populists are winning is that they have, as you've said, they've removed the future from the conversation. We're all either talking about the past or trying to defend the present. So I think the people who win are the people who actually restore the future tense to the conversation. And I think that might include some projects that are dramatic, right? That are the kinds of things that the Americans and the Chinese do, but the Europeans have been shy about, like bragging about your space program, for example. But I also think there's a lot to be said for, and I'm now just echoing what the European colleagues have said, there's a lot to be said for saying, hey, we are the only unit in the world that is actually handling the actual problems of the future which are digital human rights, um, oligarchy, climate change. We are the only unit in the world that's actually handling those things. I think there's a lot to be said for that. I think that could, that could, be, that could be a vision. Madame, peut-être sera la dernière question. A final question over there, madam. Il nous reste une minute. We got one minute left. No. We like competition in the business world. Uh, we see that as uh, something that stimulates us. In Europe, couldn't we have some kind of emulation or best practices uh, for the systems of social protection, for educational systems uh, in the Nordic or German-speaking countries, and perhaps even uh, a dynamic uh, labor market in uh, the UK, which we're losing somewhat. So rather than talking talk all the time about regulating and becoming more and more red tape oriented, can't we have an open liberal system for best practices? 
Oui, alors, euh, je pense que c'est tout à fait raison euh, qu'on doit le faire parce qu'on voit certainement Sisson. en Europe, euh, yes, il y a Mr. beaucoup Bouvard. des I think we have to do it. Uh, there are some very good practices uh, and uh, particularly uh, in the northern European countries, we have much to learn uh, from them in education sujet, uh, on the subject of diversity and durable. also in terms of sustainable investment. I don't think this has been done enough. Why? Because countries are frightened of being in competition because they think that they're going to that's going to weaken them. I think it's a question of mindset. We have to change people's mindset. I think that Europe is a community uh, where we want to help one another and where we can learn from one another. But we need also to be very careful. We don't need to uh, cut and paste. I think that uh, what is happening in France, oh, say, fantastic. They've got a German system for apprenticeship. We've just got to copy it. No, I don't think that that is uh, the right thing to do. Why? Because uh, there is a revolution in the labor market going on, copier, and you've got to copy certain things, but you have to adapt it uh, and make it uh, future-proof. So it's benchmarking, but at the same time, you've got to evolve. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. So this is the end of the session. Thank you very much for having participated. Thank you very much to the panelists. You were fantastic.